Good afternoon. Welcome all of you to the Kikes Global Education Forum of Anesthesia Department. I am Dr. Lucia Garcia Huete. I am Senior Consultant of Anesthesia Department of King Khaled Eye Specialist Hospital, Kikes, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Today, I am the moderator of this interesting uh, lecture about anesthesia consideration in patients with obstructive apnea undergoing eye surgery. Obstructive apnea osa is a syndrome characterized by periodic partial or complete obstruction in the upper airway during sleep. Is it associated with multi-organ comorbidities and increased adverse perioperative outcome? It's important to remember that these patients have an increased prevalence of ophthalmic disorders and some might require surgery. The problem is that only 25% of patients with OSA are identified before surgery. My question today is, what anesthesia consideration should be performed in these patients? Are we crying wolf? For asking this question, I have the pleasure to present Professor, Professor Chandra. Thanks, Professor Chandra, for accepting again our invitation. We appreciate. Professor Chandra, he's a senior consultant of anesthesia department who takes Puat Hospital, Singapore. Visiting Professor Newcastle University Medical School, UK and Malaysia. He published more than 150 peer review and 12 books in anesthesia, lectured worldwide as invited speaker, recipient of the highest award, Platinum 2010, was stopped by the Department of Health to a practicing UK consultant in the National Health Service. Todd Britton, Doctor Future in the Time Magazine UK. Founded the British Ophthalmic Anesthesia of Society and World Congress of Ophthalmic Anesthesia. And he has elected member of the Council of the Royal College of Anesthetic London and the Association of Anesthetic of Great Britain and Ireland in November 2010. Because patients with obstructive sleep amnea have an increased prevalence of glaucoma, I would like also to welcome our invite panelists from glaucoma, Dr. Ohut Obaidat. She's a chairman of glaucoma division of Key Case Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Welcome, Dr. Ohut. Dr. Abdul Sahur Khan. He's a chairman of anesthesia department, director of high dependency unit, and chief of the operating room Key Case Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Also welcome Dr. Newman Ahmad. He's a senior consultant of anesthesia department, Kikes Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. I would like to kindly remind you to close your micro to avoid any interference, please. And after the lecture, uh, both audience and panelists will have the opportunity to ask questions. All panelists, you can write in the chat and panelists, you can raise your hand, please. Dr. Chandra, you can start, please. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Can I share? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Lucia, Dr. Wawad, Dr. Jahur, and my friend Numan Amar. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you again today. And the topic I already been said to you is that a seizure consideration in patients with obstructive sleep apnea undergoing eye surgery. I had I managed to look at some of the names of the people who are joining this meeting tonight or this afternoon for Saudi time. And there are many big names from ophthalmic anesthesia. And I would like to mention, welcome them particularly, uh, Dr. Daniel from Brazil, Dr. Frederick Lersch from Switzerland, Professor Edwin Sheet from Singapore, uh, Dr. Associate Assistant Professor Dr. Mokhtar from Dublin, and I think there are and Dr. Matt uh, Shua from Australia. So there are some international people in the list. I haven't seen everybody. But anyway, welcome to all of you. Okay, so thanks for a very kind introduction, Dr. Lucia. I need to declare first because there are certain things which I would like to clarify first. I don't have any financial interest whatsoever. I have done the OS literature search and I found general article 4622. This is just today. 
Then I combined with anesthesia, there were 156. Then I combined with ophthalmology, there were 29. Then I combined with eye surgery, there was only one publication. So virtually there is no research on anesthesia in patients with the OSA and eye surgery. So I'm just talking, concentrating on eye. So what do I have to offer? I provide anesthesia for eye surgery in patients with OSA, but I'm not an expert in OSA. So when it comes to the question sign, I will answer you as much as I could. This was the study published, not a study, this was a review published in 2006. But unfortunately, this uh, article was not in a, um, in a peer review journal. So the only article we had which we published from Turkey and Professor Edwin Sheet I mentioned to you, he used to be my ex-boss. He's a brilliant researcher, he had worked with people like uh, Francis Chung, which you will see the list of the publication and the references I will be using it. It would be Edwin Sheep, many places, and Dr. Francis Chung from Toronto. There would be also another notable name that would be Mas Moody's from New York. And another person in this publication is Professor Girish Joshi from Texas. Again, you will find his name in many of these slides because he had done tremendous amount of work on OSA as well as ambulatory surgery. So Dr. Sheet, or Professor Sheet, he had done tremendous amount of work and I will mention that as I go along. Okay, before I go into the presentation, I would have liked to ask this question to audience. And now I can't see, but you can see me. But anyway, you don't have to answer, but just I want to know how many people do you think snore? You can't answer. But just to have an idea. Anyway, how many people you have been told by your partner or your friend or somebody in the house that you snore? Hmm. Probably, probably you know the answer. Anyway, so let's come to that, that 92% of the people snore and 62% of them are habitual. Habitual means they regularly snore and 30% of the people are non-habitual snorer. Now those who are a habitual snorer, it's usually common in obese people and majority of them suffer from obstructive sleep apnea. I'm not saying all uh, obese people suffer from this, but they're very likely they do. So OSA patient, they present for eye surgery, they can come for routine or they can come for uh, emergency. Dr. Lucia, is it possible to switch off the microphone for the time being, please? So I'm getting a lot of yeah, please. The, what the what is your what is your problem? Yes, I will. I'm saying, can you switch off the microphone of others for the time being? Uh, Silence the microphone. Yes. Yeah. Yes, no okay. problem. Okay, so I'll continue now. So anesthesia, as Dr. Lucia already mentioned, is usually hazardous. Okay, so let's see. This is an example of snoring. I hope you can hear it. Yeah, Professor, we are okay. We, we can hear you clearly. Please go ahead. Yes. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Can you hear this video? No. No, we cannot hear the video. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, we, can, we can see the video, yes. But we, there is no sound, but we can see the video, the picture. Okay, okay. Oh. That's so funny. Um, okay. Can you hear this? No, it's the same, Dr. Kumar. Only we can see the video, but no, we cannot hear. All right. The, so the this person, <laughs> okay, there's a very obese person, and as you can see, he had gone into apnea. He can hardly breathe. But he is heavily snoring. Okay, so I would like to show you another example of snoring. Look at this man.
So he's hardly breathing. So, you know, basically he has gone into apnea. Let's look at another one. I'm very sorry for the sound it didn't come. So sometimes uh, technology lets you down. This man is not obese. It is just a general weight. But he's undergoing a simple sleeper study, which is just pulse oximeter. So I want you to look at, this man has started to watch television, and he's now sleepy. Okay, so his saturation to start with is 97, then is 68 is his pulse rate. So now you can see his mouth is opening now, so he started to snore. Sorry, you don't have a sound from my computer, but it was working fine. I'm very sorry. So now his saturation has started to go down. As you can see it's a 93, heart rate is dropping, heart rate is 63 at the moment. So it's going 95, 91, and you look at his tummy, his stomach is hardly moving. So now it's at 285, 83, 77, 73. So basically he's not So saturation has gone to 61, 60. So he's choking and he just started to wake up. Now he starts breathing, as you can see. His saturation will go up. Yeah, that's a typical of example of a, a sleep apnea. So let's look at the spectrum of snoring. If you look at this picture, in this patient, there is no disease. So this is a normal breathing, occasional snoring, regular snoring, that would be the, call it a habitual. Then as the airway starts to resistance there, then they call it upper airway resistance syndrome. They go into apnea, mild apnea, moderate sleep apnea, and then severe sleep apnea. And that part of the portion is called disease part. So basically, the patient is suffering from apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, and it's a part of the sleeping, breathing disorder. So this is a disease area, that one. There are other kind of sleep breathing disorder, which I don't have time to go on. I'll just concentrate on obstructive sleep apnea. So from the next 35 to 40 minutes, we will cover the subject like this. Like what is OSA, then we look at the systemic and ophthalmic disorders common with the OSA. How do we preoperatively consider them? What are the issues intraoperatively, postoperatively? How can we do local? And then we'll summarize. So let's first look at the, what is OSA? It's important to look at this definition for the OSA. It's a syndrome. And in this one, you have a repetitive, partial, or complete airway, upper airway obstruction leading to snoring. So that's one thing. So person is partial or completely a complete airway obstruction, that is causing snoring. The another problem is happening there is the episodes of breathing cessation. That means there is no breathing. And that should last more than 10 seconds or more. If you have got these two, criteria, then you call it OSS syndrome. And as I mentioned to you, this is Professor Shi and Professor Francis Chung from Toronto. So they have done a tremendous amount of work. Okay, so in terms of the mechanism of the obstruction in airway, again, you can't see, uh, you can't hear me, but this is a normal breathing. The air is going in, going in, coming out. But now when the airway starts to become narrow, then you can see there is a floppiness. And when there is a more floppiness like this, 
then it will start making the snoring noise. That is basically the mechanism of upper airway obstruction. And now, as you can see, it's virtually closed. So at some stage in obstructive sleep apnea, it closes. And that's how the patient doesn't breathe. And then the patient wakes up. Okay. So how about the prevalence? Dr. Lucia talked us about it, but uh, in one say, sentence you can say, it is the commonest sleep breathing disorder. And it's usually seven to 10% in general population. But what is worse of it, that those who suffer is much higher in men, it's usually one in four men, those who snore, and one in 10 females. And this is the tremendous amount of work done in this one. And this study was published by Dr. Matthew Chan from Hong Kong, Professor Edwin Sheet from my place, my ex-boss, and Francis Chung is a part of this study as well. And what they found, that 80% of the patients, those who were going major surgery, they were suffering from obstructive sleep apnea. And there is another sharing uh, statistic you can see there, is that those patients who go bariatric surgery, 90% of the individual are suffering from OSA. So how do they, these patients manifest to you? Usually the partner, bed partner will, will, will know that. And how do they see, how do they know that this person has got this problem? Usually the bed partner complains of heavy snoring, Observed apnea, that means the person actually, the partner has seen that the person is not breathing. So it could be frightening. Person can be seen choking, gasping, and they are restless during the sleep. And all these lead to daytime sleepiness, fatigue, loss of memory, loss of concentration. Many of them complain of headache and whatnot. These are the simple features they complain of usually. So if you look at the systemic disorders in the OSA patient, it's amazing, it's amazing. Let's look at this body, the whole body. Look at the arrow, it's coming from everywhere. So OSA patient has got all these systemic disorders coming with the patient. And you can see a list, but we can't go on everything, but I'll summarize for you. This is another slide where you can see the cardiovascular is on one side, endocrine on the other side, and there is some numbers given. So hypertension, 83%, arrhythmia, coronary artery disease, myocardial infarction, heart failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, vascular disease, and so on. And many of these patients are diabetic. Most of them are obese. They do have gastroesophageal reflex. Many of them suffer from cancer, high incidence, and many of them have cognitive disorder. So you can see the scale of the problem, the systemic problem. If you look at the ophthalmic disorders in these patients, I will briefly touch upon some of them. There are many publications, I wouldn't call many, but there are some which we point to the different disease condition in the eye. So let's first look at the commonest one, which is cataract. OSA is not a known significant risk factor for cataract. Nobody has proven that, that the OSA patient gets more cataract. And as you know, that the cataract usually develops in people over 55. It can happen earlier, but usually it happens after 55. And as nowadays, the OSA patients are living longer, so you do expect many of them will be coming to your place with the cataract. So when you anesthetize these cataract patients, what do you do? You consider either topical, regional, GA, or we'll see what we can do later on once we see the problem. So you can do it under anything, okay. Let's look at the glaucoma. Dr. Lucia already talked about it. The incidence of glaucoma is two to 20% in patients with the OSA. So that's a pretty high number. Now, if you do anything to these patients, which can increase the intraocular pressure, such as very well can happen during general anesthesia, particularly during intubation, laryngoscopy and so on. And also the needle blocks are known to increase the intraocular pressure. So if you got a patient with the OSA who already got glaucoma and you increase further, that's undesirable because that can lead to glaucoma crisis and many people believe that can also lead to surgical failure of the glaucoma surgery. So that's a very worrying situation in these patients. 
How about the central serous retinopathy? This is a collection of serous fluid beneath the retina and usually may lead to detached retina. And this condition that is CSR or central serous retinopathy it has got a significant association in patients with the OSA. And if the patient develops a detached retina, usually the patient will end up with you as urgent or emergency surgery, usually under GA. So there are some problems there too. Another pathology got to look at the retinal vein occlusion. There are two kinds, or there are three kinds basically, but let's concentrate on two. The first would be the central visual loss. That is called CRVO, central retinal vein occlusion. Or you can have a peripheral visual loss, or that is called branch RVO. And 37 to 77% of the patient with the obstructive sleep apnea suffer from RVO can happen to them. And this incidence is much higher if the patient is already associated with glaucoma, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and any other condition. And just worth pointing out at this stage that we do know from published studies the central or retinal vein occlusion has happened after GA, and it is also known to happen after the needle block. So one had to know that this can happen to anyone and any time. Let's look at the another condition, that is the keratoconus. What is it? It's a conical steepening and thinning of the cornea. And this usually affects younger patients. So if the younger patient who has got OSA, they might end up with a keratoconus. And when they do have that, these patients are likely to require corneal transplant, usually under GA, because don't forget they are young, and most surgeons, usually prefer GA for corneal transplant. This another condition which is a non-arteritic anterior optic neuropathy, N-A-O-N. This is a sudden painless unilateral visual loss. But mind it, this is an ischemic injury to the optic nerve unrelated to arteritis. So there is no arteritis. That is why it is called non-arteritic anterior optic neuropathy. Now, the risk increases by 16% in patients with untreated OSA. So obviously, if you've got a patient who, who, who are untreated, you are likely to encounter NAON on them. But not only that, this is also reported after eye block. So you have to remember this, that this can happen, and it's also known to happen after the eye blocks. Okay. This is another condition, which is a floppy eyelid syndrome which is again in this one, the eyelid easily uh, uh, evert with the upward traction, uh, so the eyelashes are pointing downward. 90% of the patients with OSA suffer from this condition, and they come with a discomfort and infection. So the surgeon will have to do the lid surgery. When you are doing the lid surgery, or other associated oculoplastic procedure in these patients, they are usually done under local infiltration, but the surgeon may request you sedation. So sedation uh, will cause problem, we'll touch upon a bit later. And the last way is the eye trauma. OSA patients, as we mentioned earlier, they do suffer from daytime sleepiness, and they do have impaired concentration. And if those two things are there, they are prone to injury. And if they are prone to injury, they may come to you with a penetrating eye injury. And of course, as you know, penetrating eye injury, most eye surgeons will say, I need general anesthesia for this patient. So of course, you got an open globe, patient may have a full stomach, patient may have a difficult airway, many other things. Are they had been used for eye trauma, but I'm not aware of any situation where are they had been used in obstructive sleep apnea patient for eye trauma. So I have not seen any publication at all. Okay, so let's look at what do we do? How the OSA patient uh, are prepared preoperative? What do we need to do? So the first thing to do is that there are many, many guidelines published already. And there are protocols. And if you follow that, then that's what I'm going to summarize for you. And these are some of the papers been written by, here you can see Professor Sheet. Then there are some papers by uh, Frank. 
Francis Chung, uh, Dr. Girish, Joshi, and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty comprehensive paper D. So to diagnose obstructive sleep apnea, we talked about the clinical feature. Now let's talk about the bit of science. How do we diagnose them? So the first thing is known as PSG, which is called polysomnography. And that is supposed to be gold standard at the moment. There is another thing people tend to do is called apnea hypopnea index, or it's called AHI index. Then, then there is another one, but I won't have time to go into all that detail. And there are some tools which you can do the risk of certification. And one such tool is called a stop bank. Again, we will go into that bit of detail later on. So let's look at the PSG. What is the sleep study? Sleep study in this patient, as you can see, has got a lot of wires. The wires are attached to the abdomen here, on the chest, something in the nose, something is attached to the head as well. And these are, and there is a pulse oximeter attached, as you can see. So this is basically looking at the pulse oximeter, per saturation, this is looking at the abdominal movement, this is looking at the flow from there, and some of them also sample the carbon dioxide too. And some of the brain thing, they are all output here. And this one can give you a report, or if you are good enough, you interpret yourself. So this is a, one of the study which is done for almost all patients of sleep apnea syndrome. Okay. Then we mention about the apnea hypopnea index, that is AHI index. Why do we want to know this? This one, let's define what do they mean by apnea in sleep apnea patient. This is the cessation of the airflow from the nose or mouth for at least 10 seconds. That means there is no flow of air from the nose or mouth for 10 seconds. That's number one. So that would be apnea. The second one would be hypopnea. Again, this one is 50% reduction in the airflow, causing more than 4% drop in oxygen saturation. And so by, if you know that, if somebody calculates for you, whether it's you or machine or somebody, then you can compute that. So you divide apnea over hypopnea and in any one hour, and that will give you a number. And if the number, magic number is five, then it is diagnostic of obstructive sleep apnea. If the number is 5 to 15, then it is, it's called mild uh, OSA. And if number is more than, uh, sorry, it's a 5 to 15, it's a mild, it's 15 to 30, it's a moderate, and if it is more than 30, then it would be counted as severe obstructive sleep apnea. So this is giving you the grade. Let's look at the next one, which is called a stop bank. And this is another tool which you can use in your clinic very quickly. There are questions in there, and this will identify you how risky the patient is going to be. There are many other tools, but a stop bank is very common. Okay, so what is a stop bank? So if you can look at the mnemonic, a stop, S is snoring, T is tiredness, O is observed, P is the blood pressure, B is the body mass, age, neck, and gender. And so you ask them these questions. Do you snore loudly? Yes or no? There are some things there. So you get a number one. If it says yes, you give a number. Do you often feel tired, fatigued, or sleepy during daytime? If your answer is yes, you give a number. Has anybody observed you will stop breathing during the sleep? It's usually it would be the bed partner who will say yes or no. Do you have or are you being treated for high blood pressure? That you have to give a number. Then you come to the bang. Bang is if we have to measure the BMI. If the BMI is more than 35 kilograms per meter square, you give a number, yes, no, whatever. If the person is over 50, then you say yes, no, you look at the neck and uh, circumference, if it is more than 40, again, you give a number and gender and so on. So once you have answered all these O8 questions, you will get some number. So if it is yes to zero to two question, 
then these patients are at low risk under anesthesia and surgery. If the number is more than three to four, then there is a moderate risk of anesthesia and surgery in these patients. But if the numbers are five to eight, that means all SS are coming, a majority, or there are more than two stop questions, that is these four, or plus gender is a male, or BMI is high, or next size is bigger, they are high risk. So it's worth doing the stop bank questionnaire to tell the patient how risky that person is going to be under surgery and anesthesia. So that's a wonderful clinical tool. But these patients also need further assessment. And what assessment would be that? As I showed you earlier, they do suffer from several comorbidity. All systems are virtually affected. And if something is abnormal, which needs sorting out, you do that. If the BMI has not been done, then you need to assess it. The reason why, because if it is BMI more than 50, they are likely to need readmission after general anesthesia. So this is telling you something. And of course, wherever you are doing it, you need to think how I'm going to discharge the patient. Am I going to discharge the patient to the ward or is the patient going to go home? So you need to have a clear, explicit criteria for discharge. So how are these patients treated? There are some general measures. It's not, I can't go into the detail of all that, but weight loss, sleep on the side, stop smoking, no, not much of alcohol, no sedative, regular exercise, and so on. But there are some non-specific products available on the internet or in the shopping, and there are some specific. So I'll just touch upon these two. These are the non-specific product. You can see them all over the internet. They are selling it. Some are for costly, some are cheaper, some kind of a tongue device there. These are the teeth device. These are, these are the, the clip the nose or something. This goes inside the nose. This is a strap and so on. But these are not medically licensed devices or products. But what we do have medically licensed is these. And these are three different kind of machines. There are other varieties of machine. And these machines are called CPAP machine, which is a continuous positive airway pressure machine. And they have become a very small nowadays. It used to be big. And many of you might have heard recently that many countries that did not have enough ventilator, so they have been using the CPAP machine for the patient undergoing corona treatment, that's such a you know, non-invasive ventilation. Now, these machines come with a different kind of uh, mask. So that is just uh, for a, an example, I've shown you three different kinds, okay? So these are the masks fitted with a tubing, and these are recommended uh, 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 treatment for uh, 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 obstructive sleep apnea. But the biggest problem for these patients are, look at the number. 83% of the patients are non-compliant to CPAP. So, that, so you, you, you can put them on uh, and, and they don't use it. So there are problems there too. So if these patients cannot do well, then they go for surgery. And there are various types of surgery done for the OSA. And let's not go into the detail, but there are some jaw advancement or something or tongue reduction. But the end of the day, these patients may make airway difficult. That is the biggest worry for us. So if the patient who had a surgical treatment for OSA, they might be difficult to uh, have secure the airway. Okay. But what do you do if you get a patient who is suspected before surgery? You suddenly, you're doing an eye list and you've got a patient who is 120 kilo and you ask them to your, you know, does the patient snore? And the answer is yes. What can you do? What can you do quickly? Of course, these patients will have some kind of morbidity. So you have to think about that, how to do that. And as I mentioned before, this is stop bang scoring. You can very quickly do that on the ward with this questionnaire. And this one, if zero to two, you can go for routine management. If it is three to four, then you have to mitigate risk. So there are some risks involved now. And then 
post-operative, you might, you might consider sending them or sending that particular patient to sleep study, polysomnography. And if that stop bank number is five to eight, you can consider PSG and pre app CPAP, that is continuous positive air pressure. And I have put question mark in. The reason I have put question mark in that is there a good evidence to say the pre op CPAP helps? Yes, there are some papers which say yes, it does, it doesn't. But when you actually look at some of these papers, they say there are several studies which recommend positive airway pressure, but the evidence is not graded. So if the evidence is ungraded, it cannot say there is good evidence. The, there is uncertain optimum duration. So, okay, you found somebody and would need to go on CPAP. How long can you do that before you do the surgery? As I mentioned earlier, these patients do have a really low compliance. They have the machine, but they won't use it because it's very difficult for them. And many patients refuse to, to have the uh, CPAP machine. And obviously, all these will delay surgery and it will cost you money in whatever shape or form. Okay. So now let's look at, so we have done the treatment and if somebody comes with you, you have done something quickly and you know patient is OSA or suspected OSA. What are those issues which can affect us badly? And there are uh, papers, I mentioned this uh, Mem Sudis from New York and he, he has got, a, this, this paper is published from Society of Sleep and Anesthesia and Sleep Medicine and this is a guideline. So what they say these guidelines, general anesthesia, if indicated. So that means what they basically, you can say in one sense, that try to avoid general anesthesia. Then they said regional anesthesia do if possible. And the evidence there is moderate evidence, but a strong recommendation. So some evidence is there and recommendation is very strong. But whether you do general anesthesia, or regional anesthesia, both have got advantages, disadvantages, and that's what I'm going to cover in the next section. Okay, so if you do decide to go ahead for general anesthesia, what are those issues which can affect us? So first thing we have to make out that these patients are likely to be obese, and the patient is OSA, that, that's for sure. Then these patients are obese, so they are likely to have reflux, Patients are obese, they're likely to have difficulty in securing the intravenous line, measurement of blood pressure, establishing arterial line or CVP line. If you wanted to, you might not consider CVP for the uh, eye surgery, but if it was going for something else, you might have to. We mentioned earlier, these patients are likely to be difficult airway. And they are very sensitive to opioids, the OSA patient. Then the question you have to ask yourself is, am I going to do it in a day case? You're working in a day surgery center where all your cataracts or glaucoma or pterygium are done. What do I do? Do I do them as a day case or do we do as an inpatient? And how, if there are risks involved, how do we mitigate those risks? So there are some guidelines, there are some papers on suitability of OSA patient for day surgery or ambulatory center. Okay, this is a guideline from, again, this is from Dr. Girish Joshi and, and another Francis Chung. There is another paper to do whether they can do the obstructive sleep apnea as ambulatory patient. Okay, and these are the two recent papers. One is the recent one. This is 2019, another 2019. This was an old one. What they are saying, as long as you have patient optimized comorbid, they are able to use the CPAP device in post-operative period. You can do them in the ambulatory center. That's a 2012. The recent one, 2019, 2019, two papers coming up in anesthesia analgesia. What are they saying? They are doing even cancer surgery as a day case in obstructive sleep apnea patient, provided you have got appropriate resources and you have got the help of respiratory therapy. So there are provisions. Mm provide you so you can do them if you have got this if you have got that that's why i mentioned to you earlier you need to think about the discharge criteria where that patient is going to go okay so how can we mitigate this risk what are those risks involved so mitigating the risk would be 
that you have to reduce the reflux, you have to secure the airway, you might need to take some of the help of these adjuncts, which briefly we can touch upon, and particularly the awake uh, um, uh, endotracheal intubation or with your laryngoscope are very, very useful. Then you might have to think of a multimodal analgesia because I mentioned to you these patients are, are very, very sensitive to opioids, so try to avoid them if you can. Or uh, you can do another thing if the anesthetic is supposed to do some good. Some people believe strongly that you can do total intravenous anesthesia, which is called TIVA. And, and the other one, which many people prefer by evidence, saying that I would like to intubate, not me, but those authorities, that we can intubate the patient with rocuronium. And should there be any problem, you can reverse them with Sugamadex. But of course, monitoring of the neuromuscular function would be very, very important. Okay, so you got to do the monitoring of for these patients, and monitoring is absolutely essential for the so minimum monitoring a standard, whatever you do, pulse, blood pressure, ECG, temperature, uh, neuromuscular blocker, and whatnot. If you have uh, major cases going, then you might consider the CVP arterial line neuromuscular. Some people prefer to do depth of anesthesia, which is by spectral index. Some people use card cardiac output monitor. It depends how big the operation is, what you want, and how, how comfortable you feel and is strategizing the patient. We mentioned about the airway. Airway, OSA, is known independent risk factor for difficult intubation, difficult mask ventilation, or maybe even both. So what we are saying, these patients are really, really, could become difficult to intubate. And there are people are suggesting that you should do them as a pre-oxygenation for these patients, whether you can use CPAP or you might have seen something called Thrive, or you can give them a very high oxygen flow through the nose, there are done. And then the intubation, everybody would like to do that in a ramp position using video laryngoscope, or if possible, if it is indicated, you do the away. So there are different kinds of ramps. And these are the, we will, you know, depend how you want. If you don't have a, a commercial ramp, you can make your ramp in your own hospital by having, having so many blankets there, there. So this is the ramp position of the patient. Okay, that way. But there are, uh, there are you know, commercial ramps available for these patients. And we find very, very useful indeed. Okay. So if you're going to use GA, and there's no point in boring uh, most of the ophthalmologists present in this meeting, but there are something called balanced anesthesia. Balanced anesthesia is you give them anesthesia, you intubate them, you ventilate them, and you maintain them under anesthesia. How you maintain them, whether you can give them a gas, such as dead fluorine or sevoflurane, or you can maintain them with total intravenous anesthesia, and I mentioned earlier, a lot of people are wanting to go ahead with the rocuronium and sugamadex, they reverse with that, and that works well for them. But whatever do, if you are going in under general anesthesia, try to use low tidal volume and P. These are the evidence. This is uh, my colleague, Prof. Edwin Seaton, Francis Chung. Multimodal anesthesia, avoid opioid, but may not be possible all the time. But extubate them in the semi-sitting position, and when they are awake, if you do have the machine, CPAP machine might help you. What we do find very helpful, and there is increasing evidence coming, is the ultra-short-acting opioid remifentanil is being used. And I can tell you, I swear, it works very, very nice. So you run the patient on remifentanil, have the operation done, sit the patient up in a semi-sitting position, you switch off, Take your time and just the patient will wake up very nicely with that. So because it's ultra short acting, there is no uh, sensitivity left. But of course, you have to be a bit careful. <laughs> okay. So what about the post-operative issue? Are these patients straightforward? You give them general anesthetic or whatever, cataract, glaucoma, corneal graft, whatever. Are they, do they do very well? Not really. Because look at these complications, the list of complications are, are very many. And these are not unusual. It happens. It happens. They desaturate very quickly. They can go into it. And this is one of the largest studies. 
the systematic review, 61 study, 410,000 patients they've done. Uh, they compared with the 8.5 million control. So it's a big, big study as you can imagine. And they found that these things happen. But as I mentioned in the beginning of the, my presentation, there is hardly anything in ophthalmic anesthesia. There is nothing much other than the article we have published. Okay. And not only that, the medical legal implications are there. And people are suing anesthetists and the surgeon saying, you knew the problem, why didn't you look after? And so we have to be careful. So what do you do post-operative for these patients? And I would strongly suggest to you, you do need a critical care bed, at least for a day, or maybe a couple of hours. So you are happy before you discharge the patient. And we would not do anybody GA without having a high dependency unit bed or some kind of a help. Okay. But of course, you get the oxygen going so that patient returns on the baseline uh, in a room air temperature, good oxygenation. You can use the high flow nasal insufflation people have used. And I've also mentioned some people like to use CPAP. And I would like to just a bit of warning here that the CPAP for non-eye operation may be okay, but eye operation may be some problem, which I would like to highlight that. Okay, so we have looked at the general anesthesia and we found there are problems before we start. There are intraoperative problems, and there are postoperative problems, and there are medical legal implications because patients are, you know, people are suing anesthetists or a surgeon concern. And also, we need to take them somewhere at night so that we can monitor them so on. So, how about local anesthesia? What can we do? Can we do it under local? Can we do it under regional anesthesia in these patients? Let's look at some of the problems. So what's the recommendation? Recommendation I've mentioned earlier that there are some papers they are saying choose regional anesthesia. Whenever feasible, regional anesthesia with multimodal analgesia may be considered as the better alternative in OS patient compared with the general anesthesia. So it's telling us try to avoid general anesthesia. Then they look at here, that level of evidence is moderate and grade of recommendation is strong. So let's go for regional anesthesia, but let's look at what can happen. <clears throat> so when you consider regional anesthesia, of course, you have to be prepared for patient to be snoring and the surgeon is operating just in front of the head, might not like it. There may be obstructed breathing during the operation. There may be interruptions in surgery then you might have to select only minor and moderate OSA. That's why you needed to look at the sleeper study. You might just select the short and uncomplicated surgical procedure for under local, maybe such as a cataract, glaucoma, pterygium, lead surgery, you can get away. But if you're looking for two hours, two and a half hours, vitrectomy complicated with the laser, endo laser, you know, cryo, you know, whatever you need to do, uh, then you're asking for too much trouble for these patients. So you might have to consider doing general anesthesia. So let's look a bit more into the, uh, the other important consideration when you are doing uh, regional anesthesia. Which technique do we do? So obviously select appropriate regional anesthesia. Then also we know that the regional anesthesia could be associated with life and site threatening complications. There we also know there are some effect on the region, on, on the intraocular pressure. We also know there is a problem with the ocular blood flow. And should you wish to use sedation, that would be another problem. So we know that there are complications of needle block. Okay. But they say this is the latest paper from one of my friends from London, uh, England, uh, Norwich, Dr. Tom Eek. He said, local anesthesia for eye surgery is usually safe, but serious complications may sometimes occur. Sharp needle block, retrobulbar or peribulbar can potentially cause blindness or even death. Subtenone block in using blunt cannula may appear to be much safer. In fact, subtenone anesthesia is safer, perhaps, because if you look at the list of complications under subtenone, you can count them. 
because most of them have been reported as a single case report or maybe occasionally I have put S here, reports. So it's not that very many. You would not find a big series. So if you had to do, my choice would be based on what the blocks are, probably subgenome block is the better technique to employ in these patients if you can do it. Let's look at the regional anesthesia and intraocular pain. We know, we know that all needle blocks, peribulbar particularly, high volume, even the retrobulbar, low volume, old age, there's not many people use proper retrobulbar anymore, but nevertheless, if you are using a higher volume, we know that the intraocular pressure rises for five, seven to 10 minutes, and then it will start to come down. If you want to hassle the procedure, then you want to use some kind of a ocular compression device such as Honus balloon or McIntyre mercury balloon or whatever. But there is a subtenone again. There is no rise in intraocular pressure after subtenone. And if there was a rise, this rise is virtually very momentary and just goes away. Why? Because you make a hole. And so while you are injecting, there may be some rise in pressure. The moment you come out, then the pressure would become atmospheric. So most of the studies published, particularly there is one study I can show you. This is Alberti, found no rise in the intraocular pressure. So if the patient is of glaucoma and you want to do it under local or regional anesthesia, my choice would be subtenone block. But of course, some surgeons are worried about subconjunctival bleed, some are worried about the chemosis, but actually I have not found any paper in the literature suggesting that those subconjunctival chemosis, uh, subconjunctival hemorrhage and chemosis affect outcome of anesthesia. It, it may not look very good uh, cosmetically. Yeah, I may look slightly red, I may look slightly swollen, but does it matter at the end of the day what we are looking at, the safety of the patient. But the next problem you know that is that these patient, OSA patient, they do have compromised ocular blood flow. So you have to be careful, whichever technique you are doing, all blocks, I've written all blocks, including sub t -non, they all reduce ocular blood flow. And any deleterious effect if retinal circulation is already compromised, you're going to cause you more problem. So one has to be very careful. So if you were going to do, say, cataract surgery, I mean, if it was possible to do it under topical anesthesia or subconjunctival, probably that would be better in these patients. <coughs> but of course, that depends on the surgery, what you're wanting to do. <coughs> Avoid promoting sleep. This is essential in these patients. <coughs> I'm very sorry, my room has become a bit warm. <coughs> so you know that, I know that when you give somebody sedation, if it is more than, just more than enough, patient likely to go to sleep. So if you had, do have a patient who is already sleepy, who has already got high carbon dioxide, who already desaturate, and you give them sedation, there is a chance of airway collapse, obstruction, snoring, respiratory depression, movement <clears throat> and this will cause you hypoxia, hypercarbia, rise in intraocular pressure and can make surgery even much more difficult. So if you were asked to do a sedation for whatever reason, choose an agent which is safe. But do we have any ideal agent? Not really. And perhaps, perhaps, I'm not sure this dex medetimidine might be a good answer because that's supposed to be better. And some of the people who are listening to this talk may have their own judgment about it. Okay. Of course, the patient got to be monitored, whether it's a local anesthesia, regional anesthesia, or general anesthesia, ECG, blood pressure, pulse oximeter, and of course, capnography has become very important in eye surgery now. And one important thing you can do if you're doing regional anesthesia, local anesthesia, is communication with the patient and that is by hand holding. This gives a very, very reassuring effect on the patient that somebody is in contact with the patient, somebody is looking after that patient, and it does have an effect. So what can you do for the oxygen? Of course, you can't go on giving too much oxygen to these people. 
So you have to give her controlled oxygen, just little, because the patient is awake. So you don't want to do too much. Then the second problem is the buildup of carbon dioxide under the surgical drip. We know that. That can happen. <clears throat> Generally, it doesn't matter. But if the person who already retains carbon dioxide, and if your, uh, if your surgical drapes are closely applied to the face, there would be CO2 there, and there hardly they can go out. But some people do suggest that you do some active removal of carbon dioxide. That means you apply a suction device under the drape, so it will keep sucking out the carbon dioxide. Or some people use a low flow air beneath the drape that is bare hanger and you can have some space open so it can keep coming out. That's the one thing I can suggest to you. And this is one of my friends from Miami, Dr. Professor Harvard Palte, has written about this. <clears throat> okay. This is the way I do it. That I will prop up the bed. I can request a surgeon. This is, this is just for cataract. So I have propped up the bed and made the head slightly lower down. I asked the surgeon, to operate in this condition. And then you can also see, I put the head, leg end slightly up too. And I'm here holding the hand of the patient. And my surgeon is operating from here on the side way. So she usually tends to operate temporal. <clears throat> but you can do more whatever. But I'm away from the patient. And I would prefer to hold, hold the hand of the patient. And that works very well. Right. How about some people think that we can use CPAP during surgery. Okay, CPAP during surgery has been used for people going for leg surgery, hip joint, knee joint, and whatnot, because this is not, but eye surgery is very different. How can you put a CPAP mask on the face and you try to operate? Okay, some people are innovative, but when you are, <clears throat> when you are using CPAP, don't forget you will hear the noise, there would be air leakage, there would be difficulty in fitting the drape. <coughs> they may hinder surgery. And we know that there are reported complications of positive airway pressure <coughs> therapy during and after surgery. And this was an interesting case. This interesting case, but people, the, you know, the surgeon and anesthetist in a severe OSA patient, they started, who was a psychiatric patient actually. So they started the needle block, they connected the CPAP in this one, as you can see. And they even gave the sedation, infusion of propofol, remifentanil, and whatever I was saying to you earlier, they did everything, and that was no good. Halfway through, surgery was not possible, and they had to complete surgery under GA. So this patient is connected now under GA. <laughs> okay, how about the CPAP? and complication after surgery. Actually, there are a whole lot of papers suggesting to you, particularly patients where they left the left a tube insertion or had a, the, you know, DCR done or, or whatever, they do get into more difficulty with the CPAP. So if the patient who had a, 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 a DCR surgery done, I try not to use them CPAP immediately post-op because there are some problem, known problem. And you, you can see all these papers. If you, I mean, you will have this available anyway. So I think I have come to the end of the, my presentation, saying that I have covered everything, whatever needed, and you have mentioned to you that you can end up with a patient who is diagnosed or undiagnosed with OSA, but then for eye surgery, and you have to deal with that. GA is usually had it. I, I hope I managed to convince you there are a whole lot of problems of general anesthesia. RA is feasible, but you have to be very selective. It had to be short procedure. It had to be selected patient. You have to be avoiding uh, uh, sedation if possible. There is not much written in the literature on eye surgery and anesthesia. There is some limit literature on eye pathology, but not for eye surgery. <clears throat> and of course, we need a further research. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. And uh, Dr. Lucia, I just need to take a glass of water quickly. Yeah? I'll be back in a minute. <clears throat> <clears throat> wow. Yes, sure, no problem, Dr. Chandra. Okay, thank you, uh, all of you. Now, uh, we let's move to the questions. And first, uh, we would like to start with our panelists, okay? Um, with Dr. 
of Owaida when uh, the Professor Chandra come back, please, you can start with your questions. Sure, Dr. Welcome, huh, Dr. Owaida. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Lucia, I'm back. Yes. I'm uh, back. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Chandra, for this excellent uh, lecture. We'll start with our panelists. The question uh, from the Dr. Um, Oaida. Okay, let's go. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So thank you so much, Dr. Chandra. That was so engaging uh, lecture. Uh, uh, even for thank those you. who are non non anesthetists. I mean, for myself as an, an eye surgeon, but um, I was enjoying yeah. all all the lecture. So um, let me start asking um, a simple question and forgive my ignorance for, for this that's question. A, that's okay. Who, who, I, might, yeah. I might not have. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, who's supposed to, to see and diagnose those patients? I mean, whom shall we refer them to? Is it the ENT or is it, is it the, the anesthesia yeah. or is it the, yeah. Because yeah. what I know if they need an, a surgical intervention, this should go to the uh, ENT. Uh, you know, yeah. speciality. Yeah, it, it, it depends because it depends on your hospital. There are hospitals which have got sleep uh, sleep uh, department, and the sleep department could be covered by anybody. It could be covered by anesthetist. It could be covered by ENT. In some centers, it's the uh, official maxillary surgeon do it. In some centers, neurologists do it. So in, in your case, in KK ESH, probably you have got only eye and anesthesia. So one of your anesthetists should be able to detect if the patient has got sleep apnea. And that's what I mentioned quite uh, deliberately. The stop bang will give you a quick answer. Quick answer, what's the risk involved? And do we need to send them for sleep study or for whatever? And then you can take it from there because the risks are there because these patients are not simple under, under general anesthesia. Go on. And the, the, the other I, question, yeah. do, you, do you routinely apply the uh, stop bank uh, screening or the scoring? Yes, this the question patient, is, all, is uh, for all the yeah. panelists as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll let them answer. In my hospital, in the patients are seen in the pre-operative clinic. And if anybody who is heavy or seen to be bigger neck circumference and gives a history of um, um, snoring, the person will have the stop bank done. Because the stop bank doesn't take you time. It doesn't take you too long. There are only eight questions to ask, and you can come up with that, and then you can make your judgment whether I need to send this patient for pre-operative sleep study or go ahead and do the operation. Okay. Uh, let the other colleagues answer. What do you do, Dr. Jahoud, in your place and Dr. Naman and Dr. Lucia? Dr. Jahoud, do you want to answer? Yeah, instead of answer, I have actually a question. <laughs> so, oh, uh, go on, go on. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, answer, it's yeah. in relation to yeah, in, in relation to the same question, because yeah. you know the incidence, uh, the incidence of snoring uh, is quite high, as you lecture, mentioned in your lecture. And this uh, scoring system, I think that is one way. But you know, many times, uh, you know, when we take the history or because of the workload, and uh, particularly there is another thing in our mind that okay, this is a mild kind of uh, surgery. We are doing only eye anesthesia. Uh, it is very possible that uh, these kind of detail things are uh, missed um, in the preoperative assessment. So, uh, I mean, uh, what would be, I mean, in your uh, practice, the simplest way to explore it uh, based on the history or just on a uh, verbal questioning yeah. from the patient? Yes. That is one so thing. The verbal question, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and the second thing is that how do you categorize? For example, if a patient say I'm snoring, yes, but every snoring is uh, probably not, not, not the same. Yeah. yeah. 
So that's what that's where the stop by questionnaire will help you. Because if you look at the S T O P B A L J, you know, it says, has anybody seen you stop breathing? Has anybody seen you choking? So all those questions. So if you know that, and your um, I forgot to mention your ex colleague, uh, Dr. Waliz Riyad. Waliz Riyad was working with Francis Chun uh, in Toronto. So he had done a, a wonderful paper on the neck, neck circumference in these patients, in obese patients. And many of them did have these kind of things. So basically what I'm saying, that it was the end you saw me say, you got to select the patient. You got to select the surgery. And if these two are not suitable, then you don't have a choice. You have to do them under general anesthesia. Say, for example, if you had a, a vitreo retinal surgery or long procedure glaucoma, these kind of patients are not going to tolerate too long under the drip. You know that. But you can get away by, by you know, a filtration type of surgery, you know, trabeclectomy, or even ECC, you can get away uh, 40, half an hour, 45 minutes by holding the hand, by propping the bed like this, you know, so that helps and make them breathe better. But anything more than that, you have to consider giving them general anesthetic. And the moment you divide, decide to go for general anesthesia, you do have a problem. And, and it's important to, uh, to remember that, that if you did not take proper care, and I didn't want to frighten anybody, but you can see how the medical legal implications are, of the, you know, complications are, are there and, and people are seeing more people. <laughs> so you knew there are problems. You knew I needed to go to the intensive care unit or high dependency unit for a day or six hours or eight hours, but you didn't follow. You have caused me damage. And actually I wanted to show you another picture which I forgot. I had it in my mind yesterday. I met a friend of mine from uh, Nashville, US. Uh, he is ex-Russian. Uh, um, He's short, very fat neck. He suffered from OSA. And he came to listen to my talk. And, 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 and he said to me at the end, he came to come and say hello anyway, because I knew him. And he said, whatever you have said to me is exactly true. They have knocked my three teeth out with the same colleague in the same hospital. But he said he knew that that, that could happen to him. So they had in the intubation, they had a difficulty because he had a very short neck, very short stature. He had a full set of teeth. And, uh, and, and he said he ended up in three days in intensive care unit for a knee arthroscopy. So don't forget, you know, even eye surgery may not be that major, suppose it's not a major surgery. Suppose you say, you know, people say, ah, I say, no, nothing much in eye. They, you know, do one hour, one and a half hour. Yeah. But the, for us, as an aesthetist, uh, looking at the patient's comorbidity, it's not simple for us. Everything is a problem. So, you know, these things happen. So I think, I think what would be the easiest thing, what you are saying, I think, Dr. Javuri, really, have a copy of the stop bank. Let you have a look at it and say, can you implement it? Is it workable? And I think I, I can assure you it would be very workable for you. Just eight questions. If you find somebody who is 120 kilo and on a simple questioning, the person says, I do snore, your, your, your ears will start to, you know, a stand up saying, oh my God, that looks like there is a problem. And you will find that you will end up in the trouble if the patient was undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea, which is Professor Edwin Sheet and Matthew Chan from Hong Kong. They published their paper in, in, in JAMA, you know, which is a very, very, very famous journal JAMA. It doesn't get there unless you have got a, a credible, credible data. So they, have, they know that, that many patients are coming for major operation and they end up with 80%, up to 80% undiagnosed, they get into difficulty. So I, I say this to you, that, and you will be seeing more and more of these patients, you know, because these patients are living longer. They are being treated, they picked up early, so they go for sleep study. So the, the, you, you will be doing more cataract and more glaucoma and more, more detachment kind of uh, uh, procedure on them. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Chandra. I just have a, 
uh, another yeah. small question if Dr. Lucia allow yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the recommendation, the recommendation for extubating uh, these patients in a semi-fitting position. Yes, yes. Uh, this, uh, Dr. Lucia, uh, this noise is coming from some of the audience or? Uh, there is now, some disturbance, I think. Yes, now I don't know, but uh, okay, can you continue, please? Dr. Safu? Yeah, please. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, uh, my question was about the recommendation for extubating these patients in a semi fitting position. Uh, if the patient have obesity, uh, certainly there is a known advantage of that, but uh, I mean, there are there is a good percentage of patients who have sleep apnea and they are not obese uh, or not significantly obese. So do we still have any advantage beside the, I mean, uh, for semi-sitting? Because I'm also thinking that semi-sitting position sometimes can lead the patient to go into bronchospasm, uh, to laryngeal spasm, for example. Um, you might have seen that, that's why I flashed it, that, that semi-fentanyl seems to have change the practice of many people. And I can't I can say to you that uh, uh, since I've been using it, I mean, fentanyl, uh, I find it very useful. I have not published it, but there are other people who have published about Remy fentanyl. It worked very well, Jehu, it does work. Because all those problems of extubation, you see, these patients, if you extubate them lying flat, you still got a problem of the regurgitation, eh? these patients. But if you're sitting them up, I think the theory behind it, your diaphragm is down, your abdominal contents are down, they tend to breathe better. And because you have used remifentanil, it doesn't have a long-term the opiate effect on the body other than, you know, you can get a bit of a, what do you call, um, uh, some people, the chest becomes a bit rigid after prolonged, after prolonged uh, remifentanil. But short remifentanil, I probably have not observed that in practice. But uh, Prolonged use, couple of hours, people have seen that, that, uh, that they can. Um, and that's why you may find that the, most of the published literature will say to you, before you switch off the Remy, if the procedure is any pain at all, just cover pain first before switching off the Remy, because those things tend to exacerbate. But I, I, I leave that decision to you. I think I am very happy following the uh, so SAMBA guidelines, sleep apnea guidelines, that they all recommend that put them up slightly, head up position, and extubate them. You're less likely to get into trouble. And I, I can only say to you, my practice has changed after uh, looking at those guidelines, and that's what I do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Dr. Awaida, do you have more questions? Uh, well, yeah, maybe I can uh, drop one or two <laughs> questions here. Okay. Do you so, want to, uh, yes, to ask, please? Yeah, yeah, please. So, uh, Dr. Chandra, you know that uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a glaucoma specialist, so I'm concerned yeah. about uh, those, those yeah. glaucoma patients uh, who are yeah. uh, on, on treatment. I mean, who are already diagnosed as a sleep apnea and they are already on, on treatment. Uh, they are on the CPAP. So, you know that uh, the, uh, you know, the, the sleep apnea itself, there are, we need to, to know the, the, the stages and the physiology of the sleep pattern itself so we can understand how, how does the, the pressure changes, the intraocular pressure changes during the sleep and what does sleep apnea do to those patients. So what I know uh, that during sleep apnea, the, the IOP usually decreases and this is because the sleep apnea um, affects the slow pattern sleep, okay, if, if, I, if I'm not wrong. What happens is that the pressure, the eye pressure goes up again if, if there is a restoration of the, uh, of the uh, respiration again, and that happens with the CPAP. So those patients who are on the CPAP, they are more liable or they are having more risk of having more increase in the intraocular pressure. 
So these are the yeah. patients that we should be worried about and we should be concerned mm -hmm. about. So do, do you recommend that those patients who are um, sleep apnea and on CPAP that we should make like a, a follow-up or a check for, for their uh, glaucoma signs or what's your recommendation here? I, I thought... I think, you know, obviously, you are the glaucoma surgeon, you know, you see them more than I do. Um, I will purely look at, from an anesthesia point of view, that I don't want to do anything which can affect your operating condition or which can affect, make the glaucoma worse. Now, if the patient does have the OSA, yes, glaucoma is there and you are treating it, but the patient has got a lot more problems such as, you know, they're likely to develop a heart attack, they're likely to develop a hypertension, diabetes, whatnot, you know, all those. So the recommendation for the sleep apnea people would be to put them on treatment and take the consequences for whatever happens in glaucoma, whether when you got low or high, but they, they need to use it because if they don't, um, I, I have seen in my family too, uh, many people, those who, who have uh, obstructive sleep apnea, they snore so heavily, you can hear them snoring, snoring, and then just go quiet, and again, start again, and the noise is terrible, terrible. I've seen that in family. So, I, I, I'm not sure what the answer would be. The pathology, but what I do know from reading your literature on glaucoma and OSA, there is increasing evidence, definitely, that OSA makes the intraocular pressure go up. Whether it transiently, it decreases it, uh, uh, that, I, that I don't know. That I don't know. You know more. You know more about that than rather than I do. But I mean, from anesthesia point oh. of view, there is no protocol or guidelines that, uh, for example, no, I, uh, I, advice to, to, to refer those patients to, to ocular service. Uh, uh, no, I, I, think, I think the sleep people, if they do have a thalamic uh, department, if they find that these patients should go for a normal checkup with the eye surgeon, yeah. And they will come to your eye department anyway, because most of them will become diabetic and, and they will have a retinopathy and they end up in the eye department. Yeah, but we don't want to see them with an advanced glaucoma. We want to pick them you at the beginning of this. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, I, think, I, think uh, I mean, you know, I've got, I mean, I'm sure you have seen some of those published. I, I may have uh, seven or eight publications on glaucoma, but I picked up all those articles and I, I filtered all what matters to me as an aesthetist, that what do I do if I have these patients? And that's where I mentioned to you that the pressure is already high in the, most of these patients. And if I use a retro a peribulbar, high volume peribulbar, that I know that that's going to increase your 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 you know intraocular pressure for seven to ten minutes, and that can wipe out your uh, you know the the vision in these patients. And of course, that would be then I would be responsible for it. So my choice would be that as I said to you that I would probably go for and I do go for subkinone block and talk to my surgical colleague. Yes, it's unsightly for you probably. We may have a concern about the surgical glaucoma, you know, surgical failure, but let's look at the patient. Uh, don't, you don't want to lose the eyesight uh, at any cost. So let's accept something which is better. Subtenone block won't, won't increase your intraocular pressure and get the job. Anesthesia is a very, very good one with the subtenone block. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Awaida. Uh, Dr. Sahur, do you want to, to do more questions? To ask? Uh, I, I'm okay for now. You can go ahead. Okay. Dr. Dr. Newman, do you have uh, you. any questions? Yeah. Thank you, Professor Chandra, for uh, excellent presentation. It was very Thank informative. You. Uh, regarding, as you have mentioned, and we know that there is an association of obstructive sleep apnea and the post-operative complications. Yes, and especially yes. there is a more pulmonary complications yes. and the desaturation events in the post-operative period and even the cardiac complication. So do you suggest that those patients who are done under general anesthesia, they should be admitted overnight 
in particular mm. with uh, yeah, yeah. sleep apnea patient because medical legal point of view also or yeah, what is that, uh, what you recommend because we do many patient as a day care uh, surgery and sometimes we give general anesthesia also so yeah, yeah. ideally do you recommend that all uh, obstructive sleep apnea patient should be yeah. done as an inpatient yeah yeah so what we do uh, i mean that that's my uh, the singapore is very safe the singapore hospitals are very very safe they they do know that if you you should do what is right for the patient so if i'm going to do two and a half hour or two hours reject me uh, uh, and it is got to be under general anesthesia i would find a high dependency unit bed where we can take the patient as far as the reason the the cataract is concerned I, I think I have not come across any uh, problem where um, I, I would have not been able to complete the cataract. Of course, with folded hand, I'll go to my surgical colleague and I would say, this patient is not for training. Yeah. I, I, will, I will just do like this. This patient is not for training. This patient is, you do quicker, better job, get out quickly we can avoid general anesthesia. So general anesthesia, the regional anesthesia will work very nicely for you. Subtune on block for the cataract and, and filtration, filtration glaucoma surgery. If you were doing something like Ahmed Valve or Bervelt or Goldchamp or something like that, depending on how this lost me, but still people are doing it, then you are talking, uh, it would be very difficult to do this lost me in these patients. Because even you know, Dr. Oida will say, you know, the patient is slightly moving the head like this. How can I operate? But with, with, the, with, the, with the FACO, with the extra capsule, you can take that risk because head movement is not that big problem, uh, particularly for the modern FACO surgery or even with the extra capsule. But so operation where you want the head still, like you're doing a vitrectomy, you don't want anybody snoring there in the middle of the operation. It's not, it's not practical. So if the question you are asking me, think, if I know the patient definitely had got obstructive sleep apnea, we know these patients are likely to get into difficulty post-operative, I will have a bed assured somewhere. If he doesn't need it, that's very good. Patient can go after six hours. So what we'll do if we don't have a high dependency bed and I had to do the operation, at least what we tend to do as the recovery unit, to continue helping us for a couple of hours so that at least we can watch the patient and say, okay, now we can let the patient go home. Okay. Uh, but uh, but my, my inclination would be to have a high dependency bed available before I go ahead for elective, elective longer duration surgery sorry, sorry. or a surgery, surgery which required complete still head. Like if they are doing the peeling of the membrane, mm -hmm. I, I don't expect the surgeon to accept my technique of regional anesthesia where he's trying to peel or he's trying to fire the laser where the patient's head is moving because of the obstruction. That, that's, not, that's not good. So the patient got to be you know, um, admitted to the, or at least have a bed available in, in, in the high dependency unit. Or where at least there is a person to monitor that patient. I'm not saying intensive care. Intensive care is something else where you have other patients who need to be intubated, got to be ventilated. High dependency is an area where you can convert somewhere where you can have one-to-one -one care for six hours, eight hours, 10 hours, whatever your level of comfort is. So thanks for asking. That's a very, very good uh, question to ask uh, for, for advice. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chandra, regarding as we, we do many cases under uh, regional anesthesia and sometimes we need to use the sedation under regional yeah. anesthesia for, as you have mentioned, and we know that the sedative medications, <coughs> they depress the pharyngeal and the laryngeal reflexes. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. There is a role of dexmotomidine you already mentioned, but I was reading the other day that the uh, there is a uh, role of uh, low dose ketamine. Uh, yes. The <clears throat> Normally we don't use it because of we know it increases IOP and cause some nystagmus, but it prevents the 
it keeps the tone of the pharyngeal and laryngeal muscles. Yeah, yeah, it might, so might be. Do, do you have any experience or to share with No, us? I haven't actually. But what you are suggesting, Norman, that because you are doing a large number of cases, uh, perhaps you can do a study on the ketamine usefulness. Because I tell you what, there is nothing at all published, you know. Nothing at all published. The, the only article I could find, you know, that's why we ended up writing that. Uh, with, the, with a colleague of mine from Turkey, Dr. Oyacho, and of course, Professor Edwin Sheet with my colleague, and Girish Joshi, we, we contacted them and said, you know, we are increasingly getting these patients. How do we do? We looked at the, uh, the uh, literature available, and there is nothing, there is nothing on anesthesia for eyes. Housekeeper to room 11, please. Housekeeper to room 11. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do you have more questions, Dr. Newman? Right now it's okay. We okay. will proceed further. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have uh, some questions about our participants. There are a question yes. from Dr. Friedrich Lerch. Lerch. Yes. Lerch. Okay. Hi, hi, Friedrich. <laughs> yeah, he's no, from uh, the Switzerland. Okay. Uh, he, he has a question for you. In the yeah, sleep, yes, in the sleep electroencephalogram, um, sleep apnea patients with uh, show sometimes arousals. Do you come across reports if increase incidence of awareness in general anesthesia or starling movement in sedation? Do you have uh, any information uh, about uh, that? Uh, uh, no, I don't. I don't actually, uh, because I know the, the person who is asking you he is very well into the, the arousal and the neurocognitive uh, function in, in some of these patients. So he might have the answer, but unfortunately, it looks like he, 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 he would you allow him to speak on the Zoom. Can you can you unmute him? I would like to. Yeah, he has got a wealth yes. of knowledge. Yeah. He does have a wealth of knowledge. I know his written material, and I have spoken to him a couple of times. Let me let so me might, try. Yeah, let please. me try if I can. Doctor Lush. Yes. Let me try because no, I cannot see. He's saying the study is saying the ketamine does the bed. Yes. Uh, the... Yes, you can. You can all only you can read uh, his comments in oh, the in the in so... the chat and the questions. Okay, L let me ask him the question so that he can he can chat that. Uh, Frederick, can you do you know the answer yourself because you have asked the question? I'm unable to answer that because I I don't think I got the the. Uh, the question right are you asking that the patient could become aware or are you asking is the patient under regional anesthesia they can suddenly wake up if the second question if they can suddenly wake up that happens in obstructive sleep apnea they go to sleep they don't know where they are their, their carbon dioxide level goes up they, because they have stopped breathing and they suddenly wake up jack that's the normal but about awareness in these patients, I'm not aware of. Uh, Chandra, of course, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. yes, oh, now, yeah, yes, you. yes, yes, now you. You. you can. Yes, thank you. Hi, Chandra. Great. Hi, call. hi. I don't know the answer either. I see it on sleep EGs all the time, and I'm always quite curious whether that sig whether the behavior and sleep of these OSA patients signals that they might be more prone to go aware because the, the brain is really used to going from sleep to being awake. But I haven't found any data on that either. Just a short comment on the ketamine. We've done, yeah. we've done some hypothesis forming measurements already. And especially when the patient is um, in, in uh, multimodal anesthesia, when we have given dexmedetomidine and uh, Disoprivan propofol, the pressure of the eye has already come down so far that there's no reaction to ketamine. So I think what we all learn that ketamine raises the IOP, it dates from a study made in Japan in the 1970s 
when ketamine was used as a as a soul as an only sedative and that is quite if you've ever done it you know that the sympathetic um, tonus goes up so much that obviously there will be a raise in intraocular pressure but we've done about I'd, I'd say 60 measurements and th there is a methodological problem that we still have to tackle but once we give ketamine as an analgesic in general anesthesia we never see a raise in the intraocular pressure we haven't seen it so i think um there's other things yet that you want to consider with ketamine but in the in the literature of the multimodal anesthesia it gets very very good reports and it has several effects that we should consider especially in uh in OSA patients together with dexmedetomidine it uh, decreases the likelihood of spasm in the in the smooth muscle in the smooth muscle muscles we use it quite a lot in adults and in children and we haven't seen laryngeal spasms or bronchial spasms in children since so the combination of dexmedetomidine which raises the likelihood of bronchial spasm and ketamine seems to be working quite well on, i think on different mechanisms uh, a decrease of tone in the smooth muscles and an anti-inflammatory uh, effect that we see quite a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. I think what Dr. Naman was saying that the kind of cases they do, Frederick, is they do large number of these patients. And uh, uh, I, I, I don't have. I... Dr. Chandra, we lost your voice. You lost my voice because yes. there, is lot, there is a lot more noise coming from the back, so I can't, uh, I, I cannot. So what I'm saying that, uh, yes, what Frederick is saying is correct in the sense that if the ketamine is used as a single agent, as a, as a part of anesthesia, all those textbooks of ophthalmic anesthesia or, or, or anesthesia, they all say increases the intraocular pressure. That's true. But is it true when you have got inhalational agent going, when you have got propofol going, and you have used ketamine as an adjunct, may not be that true. The reason I didn't want to make comment on ketamine, because since my early days of using ketamine, uh, I'm talking about 30, 35 years ago, that, you know, the kind of a hallucination you got then, uh, uh, and the patient did have the dream, it was not worth using it then. Uh, and at that time, you have to use some kind of a, um, a diazepam or timazepam, some kind of bench of diazepam to prevent that happening. But since then, ketamine has formulation has been changed, the dose regime has changed, its indications are different nowadays. So many people are ending to use ketamine, even for sleep apnea patients, they do the nasoscopy and things like that under ketamine. It tends to work very well. What Noman is saying that, and, and Frederick, he has got a lot of patients, perhaps two of you can collaborate. I would be happy to be a, a part of your study if you want to, that, uh, that uh, something could be looked into saying, is this myth of ketamine increases intraocular pressure in a small dose? Is it true? I think you've got to cast this question as, as a hypothesis. It's not true. And then you've got to look at saying, is it true? And, and, and do the study and compare the patient with or without whatever methodology you have. And that would be a very, very interesting study, particularly in terms of the eye. Uh, you know, uh, intraocular pressure. I hope it makes sense. You got it, Dr. Lucia? Yes, it does make. Yes, it does make sense, Chandra. And um, we, it's not our own um, data or preliminary data. There is more out from a children's study, and I think just last week there was a colleague who published a series where they looked into the use of ketamine with the use of the analgesia uh, nociceptive index that measures the sympathetic parasympathetic tonus. And they saw that a bolus of 0 0.5 ketamine per kilogram did not raise the sympathetic tonus, which is very much in tune with what we see. 
And um, we, we have EEGs. So in our eye patients, the standard mix is dexmedetomidine, propofol to sleep, a laryngeal mask, and 0 0.5 milligrams of ketamine just before incision. We yeah. see that the EEG changes. We usually give a little um, rocuronium to prevent salivation that might sometimes be seen with the ketamine. And sometimes there's some additional regional anesthesia. But we have very good results. You can, while the, while the surgeon is doing the conge work, you can already spontaneize the patient. And usually, if you know your surgeon, he does the last stitch in the conge. You can oh. take out the laryngeal mask and the patient will oh. still be sleeping. Yeah. And then uh, he sleeps off maybe half an hour and then he comes to and he's, he's really wide awake. So that's a big, huge difference to what we saw before with the propofol remifentanil. So this is our standard procedure. Uh, Dr. Lucia? Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Thank Lucia, yes. I've, I've been looking at the question and answer. There are three questions have come. One is from Indonesia called mm -hmm. Anna Marie Krisa Krisa. She had asked me the one question. She's from Jakarta. She's asking, do you have any specific choice of anesthetic technique for severe case of OSA? Uh, the anesthetic technique, I think if you, Krisa, if you are still listening to me, would be that most people, those who do actually the operation surgery, anesthesia for surgery of OSA, they will go for opioid-free type of anesthesia, ventilate them as much as you can with the muscle relaxant, probably rocuronium they go for, but I can assure you, majority of them, 99% of them, tend to use remifentanil because it makes life much easier. That's what I can recommend to you, Krisa. Okay, there's another question. Another question, Lucia, she's a, she's a friend of mine from Nottingham in England, Dr. Adrian. Yes. Uh, he's asking, uh, what would be your discharge criteria if you proceed with GA for patient with mild to moderate OSA who does not use CPAP machine. I think, Adrian, if you're still listening to me, there are a couple of papers, these are do not relate to eye, because I mentioned to earlier saying there is nothing in the eye, uh, and I was surprised that nothing has come from Morfield Eye Hospital and places like that. Uh, so what they do have is from, uh, from a Toronto group and the New York group, that they do say that if you do have, uh, you can do them under uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 in ambulatory surgery, provided they have got to provide you, saying so you have got the adequate facility and you have got a, they call it a respiratory therapy. What they mean is somebody who can help with the CPAP machine and whatnot. But in terms of the eye, do you really want to use CPAP machine post-op? That's the question. And one of my last slides I showed you, there were about 11, I noted 11 complicated reports of CPAP in patients, particularly who had DCR, DCR, you know, whatever the tube we call, Lester-Jones tubes and so on. Uh, and these patients had a leakage, they had a failure of the operation, they had a conjunctival problem, they had a nasal problem after CPAP. So in terms of the eye, I think the post-op CPAP uh, in criteria would be minimum type of a, a selection procedure for the patient that is a, that is a, a, a simple OSA or moderate OSA, you can call it up to that, up to the, you know, depending on the AHI score, if anything more than that, probably not worth doing it in the in the day unit but the 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 two papers i mentioned to you coming from uh, uh, anesthesia anesthesia they are doing major cancer surgery in this surgery and they said there isn't a problem provided they've got the backup uh, what backup means is difficult for me to understand respiratory therapist and and backup service for the cpap machine so for peripheral operation doing hysterectomy or something like that that person can have the CPAP machine, but CPAP machine for the eye, to me, doesn't seem to be 
to be that applicable clinically. Uh, I hope, I hope, Adrian, you 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 heard my voice. Thank you. Um, there Thank you, another... Dr. There are another yeah. one. No, I no, didn't see more. A... I think no, no. no more. I would no like more. to. I would like to ask some question about children, Doctor Chandra, because also there are children with uh, sleep apnea syndrome. Um, for for this patient, what kind of um, induction do you recommend? Inhalatory uh, 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 or endovenous? Okay, I, I just I would like to show you a slide. Can I? Yes. Yes. Okay. You can screen your. Okay. Okay. To, yes. Okay. Right. Um, okay. Um, to be honest with you, I don't do pediatric at all because my the hospital I'm working in, there is no pediatric bed at all. So we do not do any pediatrics. Pediatric goes to pediatric. But what I can tell you from reading the literature, as you can see here, the prevalence of OSA in pediatric varies from 1% to 6%. What they also say, the pediatric OSA is different than the adult. That is, they don't have daytime drowsiness. They are not that noisy. They could have, they are, sorry, they are drowsy, they are paradoxical movement, mouth breather, nocturnal sweating. And the most common etiology in children appears to be adenotonsillar hypertrophy. But what is most important, what is most important is this last bullet point. Pediatrics should be done in a pediatric eye center with the known OSA knowledge. So I don't think I should, I should even attempt to do it because number one, I don't have a bed and I don't have that experience of doing that in pediatrics. Pediatric obstructive sleep apnea is a branch in itself. So that, that's what I can say, Dr. Lucia. Okay, no, thank you so much. Another question I would like to ask is about the efficacy of the chlorinidine and dexmedetomidine as adjuvants in the postoperatory pain treatment. If you have uh, any recommendation. Uh, I are you talking about the eye postoperative pain? Yes, eye postoperative pain. And, yes. and, and obviously, you are talking about what condition would you call it a uh, end stage glaucoma, a neovascular in, glaucoma? In, gen in general, in all, in, yes, in all eye surgeries, if you have so any in, experience. Yeah, um, I do have experience of clonidine. Uh, clonidine has got two problems. Number one, it's very unpredictable. The dose got to be judged very, very quick, very nicely. Otherwise, you end up with a hypotension. That's number one. Number two, clonidine can also give you sedation. So, you know, people will ask me that question or ask anybody saying, do you really want to use clonidine for postoperative pain relief if you got better agent? And better agent could be anything in modern time, could go anywhere from non-steroidal to simple paracetamol or whatever. And if the case, I'm not sure, which case are you referring to, Lucia? Uh, which case is such a problem in eye patient, which is a pain requiring clonidine or, or something else? Yes. What kind uh, of case? Yes, for example, will be an, a glaucoma patient. Do you know yeah, clonidine, yeah. clonidine, and dexmedetomidine? We know that decrease the intraocular pressure. Okay. Yes. Yeah, the, the scenario will be a patient with glaucoma and severe, severe uh, sleep apnea, and um, yes, I have um, pain. Uh, we give uh, paracetamol. We give. Uh, we must avoid opioids, and um, you can give. In, inside the OR, a small dose of clonidine and dexmedetomidine previously, and for the postoperative uh, pain as adjuvant. Yeah, yeah. As adjuvant. Yeah. This well, is what are, the, the yeah. scenario that uh, there are this possibility. Yeah. I am so thinking about do, it. Hmm. Yeah. You can do a research on that one because it depends, because your center is very big. And you might be getting a lot more neovascular glaucoma. And everybody who deals with neovascular glaucoma, you all know that. They are, they are so much in pain 
And that's why you're doing some kind of a laser surgery for or laser application for them. So they, you know, do that. Or sometimes even when you end up, if they still have got the uh, lens, then you have to do, take the lens out to, to help them. But these patients are troublesome, troublesome. Uh, whatever you can do for them would be good. So if, uh, if you add the clonidine, the, the only problem with the clonidine would be that if you wanted to use it clonidine, perhaps you will have to use with a needle block because subtenone, I'm not sure I have seen anybody using clonidine as a subtenone delivery. Have you? No, no, no. No, so I mean, subtenone, there are subtenone For delivery. Peri peribulbar, peribulbar, yeah. yes, yeah. clonidine, yes. But yeah. so there, there, are, there, are, there are other drugs which have been used through subtenone de de method, uh, you know, particularly uh, you know, steroids and whatnot, you know, they do use. But I have not seen any report of, uh, of clonidine which can be given subtenone. Most people have used clonidine as, as a peribulba. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, I would like, I think we can talk a long time, but uh, now uh, we don't have more time, Dr. Chandra. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if we can do the last question for our panelists, if you... I'm, I'm, I'm happy, I'm happy to answer. I'm just looking at some of the questions. Uh, you, you go and ask and I'll just look at the, some of the questions. No, no, no. It's not more questions, no. Dr. Chandra. No, more. Um, no, no. no. I think uh, if you want to add um, some uh, final comment about uh, these patients, uh, in obstructive sleep apnea? Yes. To finish I, uh, my, our my, my, yeah, my advice would be to be careful on the ward because the number of obstructive sleep apnea will keep on increasing. There are many patients who are known OSA and they have seen the sleep uh, consultant. They have been advised to follow CPAP, but they do not because more than 83% of the people do not use CPAP machine, even though they have been advised to. So these patients will have a associated comorbidity. You know that. The patients who have got OSA will have comorbidity. And particularly in the eye situation, we all the time you are dealing with the diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, most of the retinal work, retinal work these patients are involved. And on top of that, if they have got OSA, be careful, have this some kind of a screening tool. As I said, there are different tools, but in my practice, I found advocated by Francis Chung, she was the right on this one, the stop bank, uh, and my colleague, my ex-boss, Edwin, has done some work on this as well, and Walid Riaz has done some work on this one. So to me, uh, a stop bank appears to be a very easy questionnaire to, to, to to do that and you quickly score that and say, what do you want to do? Uh, uh, depending on the scoring system, you can send them for pre-operative pre assessment to the sleep clinic, or you can go ahead depending on what, what the scores you got. That's what I got to suggest to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chandra, uh, for sharing again your huge experience and your knowledge with us. Thank you, our invite panelists, for your significant contribution in this lecture. And thanks all our participants for sharing your time with us. I hope the topic has been of interest of all of you and also you enjoy with, with us. Okay. I would like to thank you all for asking me to speak. And I can see still there are 45 participants. So all those who joined, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all thank of you. you. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. Thank, thank you. you for thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Department. Okay. Thank, thank you. you so thank you, Dr. Jawad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adda. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.